Perfect. So as a young university student, engineering was never an option for me. I didn't know any engineers. And to be honest, I really didn't see a place for compassion or a place for helping people in engineering. So medicine it would be. My mom was a doctor, and uh, my brother was in med school. It made perfect sense. So my first year of university, I registered into the Faculty of Science. It was all gung-ho, got into my classes, but something didn't feel right. I felt unsettled. So I reflected, and you all know what happened. I transferred out of the sciences and went into engineering. But if I'm going to be honest, I was terrified with doing that. And the reason I was terrified was because I didn't think I'd find any engineer like me. Gregarious, passionate, and with this burning drive to help other people. Well, this was 25 years ago. I did meet a few like-minded engineers. And during my training as well, I did learn how engineers help people, right? Through those brilliant technological advances. But as my career progressed, what I noticed was that sometimes engineers put such emphasis on those technological advances that at times we forget that people and places matter. That's when I realized that compassion really had a role in engineering. Because when it comes to compassion, it allows you to put yourself into somebody else's shoes, truly understand what they are going through. And the power in that is that then you can create thoughtful and considerate solutions to problems. So, that is the foundation when it comes to engineering with decency. And I had an opportunity early on in my career when I was doing my PhD to take a course from a professor from Ohio State University. And he shared a groundwater contamination case study with me. It occurred in this small idyllic town called Woburn, Massachusetts, a bedroom community to Boston. And what happened here was there was a specific street called Pine Street where the residents started to notice that their water smelled funny, uh, the taste wasn't very good, actually to the point where they had to add juice crystals to their water just to be able to drink it. So the residents would then complain to the city, and the city engineer would say, it's okay, don't worry. I've run my tests, everything is fine. He'd reassure them his intentions were good. And the reason the water, he said, didn't taste good is because of the chlorine we're adding to make it safe. So the residents listened, but things didn't get better. So they would complain, and the engineer would reassure them. And the residents would complain, and the engineer would reassure them. And the cycle would go on for three years. That always made an impact on me. Because the engineer was so certain that his technology was keeping all those residents safe. His intentions were good. But things got worse. A cluster of childhood leukemia cases started to pop up in Pine Street. And Ann Anderson, one of the mothers, decided to rally up the residents and hire a lawyer to figure out what was going on. And what they found out was that there were several companies that had contaminated the groundwater. And two of the drinking water wells were impacted. And the water from those wells serviced Pine Street. The court case was long and complicated. And the Environmental Protection Agency had to come in, file a lawsuit to force two of those companies to clean up the contamination. At the time, it ended up being the largest cleanup ever in the history of northeastern United States at a cost of $68 million. But the cost that struck me was the human cost. Seven people died, one person ended up in remission. But look at the ages. It's predominantly children. So I always thought, if that engineer 
maybe gave more value to what the people were saying, and maybe didn't trust as much the technology he was using at that time, what difference he could have made. So this case study really made an impact on me, and I have carried it ever since I have heard it. And now in Canada, I work on groundwater contamination issues, and I always find it interesting the response I get. Is there any work for you? Canadians and people from all around the world think we're a mecca of clean water. But that's not necessarily the case. This shows you a map from a study carried out in 2015 showing all the drinking water advisories we have in Canada. And what's interesting is it's our First Nations communities that are impacted the most. In Alberta alone, 87% of First Nations communities have had a drinking water advisory in the past 10 years. What's shocking in Ontario, one nation has had a drinking water advisory for 20 years. So why is that? Why is it that some of us don't have to worry about our water, but yet when it comes to First Nations communities, they are being left behind? So I've had the opportunity to work with several First Nations in Alberta, many of them located in beautiful places. And this here, hard to see, you, is a picture of a herd of wild horses in one of the communities. Most recently, I worked with a community that was very concerned about their water. And I had two engineering students that embodied the engineering with distancy philosophy. So what did they do? Naturally, they decided to go and live in the community. So this is Travis, one of those students, sitting on the lawn of the house that he lived in in the summer of 2013. Now, Travis and Frazier were a little uncomfortable. They've only ever lived in the city, never have lived in a rural environment. They also weren't super comfortable with all the semi-feral dogs that are common in these communities, or the poverty, or the homes in disrepair. And they also didn't know if they had anything to offer the community. And the community in turn, kind of thought it a little bit weird that these two city boys wanted to live in their community and also weren't sure what they had to offer the community. But Travis and Frazier knew it was important to live in the community and started to participate in events. Frazier participated in his first rodeo. Didn't go so well for Frazier, but the community fell in love with them and they started to invite them to more and more events, sweats, rite of passage ceremonies, an enormous amount of trust began to build between Travis and Fraser and the community. So when they progressed with their work, what they found was as engineers, we always chlorinate wells to keep it safe for drinking. But it was the first time that Travis and Fraser actually drank that water after shot chlorinating a well. Tasted, shocking, awful. They also started to realize that some of the Western systems and checks and balances we had in place were really failing the community. Because some members in the community thought they were on a boil water advisory and actually weren't. And worse yet, some members of the community didn't think they were on a boil water advisory, but actually were. So Travis and Fraser were wondering, after all of this, do they really trust their water? So they went out and surveyed the community. Those that said no, 100% drank bottled water. Not a shock. But what about those that said yes, they do trust their water? 62% still drank bottled water. Not a surprise, right? The systems had failed them, so why would they trust it, even if somebody told them that it was safe to drink? But when things really changed for Travis and Fraser is when one of the community members started to share their perspective on water. That water has a conscience and is a living being. Now, in all honesty, Travis and Fraser first thought, oh my gosh, this is crazy, but decided to put that away and to listen. And so they learned that water is a giver of life. If we really thought that water was alive, how would we treat it? 
we treat it with an enormous amount of respect, right? It wouldn't be a commodity. We wouldn't pay for it, we wouldn't sell it, we wouldn't contaminate it, and then we wouldn't dump more chemicals in it to then make it fresh and potable again. This rocked Fraser and Travis's world, and they started to realize they had a lot to learn. But through this experience, they appreciated the fact that they needed to slow down. They needed to talk and listen, and to truly hear perspectives that were very different from the ones that they grew up with. It completely changed them as engineers. And for the community, they realized what a valuable role they had had in the engineering education of these two students. So now I can't keep up with these requests. I have engineering students constantly asking me for experiences that embody engineering with decency, where curiosity and compassion lead the way in how they tackle problems. Today, I have the pleasure to work with another student, Tori Thompson, a mining engineering student. She's worked with uh, many communities, First Nation communities in the North, and she is an example of engineering with decency because she holds a profession accountable and ensures that human dignity is at the core of everything that we do. So this makes me very optimistic for the future. And now I can say there are many, many engineers just like me. So with that, I'll leave you with this Cree proverb. Love one another and help one another because there is no greater calling. Thank you.